Have a look at this. This video was taken in 1946 by legendary folklorist Kevin Danaher in Essay County Limerick. It's one of the oldest videos, if not the oldest video of a baron being played. And even though there's no sound, what makes it particularly interesting to me is that the technique which the player is using in principle is very similar, if not the same to many baron players, including myself today. But the evolution of performance practice is much more complex than this, with multiple recollections of different styles and approaches to playing in different parts of the country, and a shortage of primary source evidence to back it all up. The composer and academic Miholo Sulovan was one of the first to try and evaluate the spread of different approaches, and his fieldwork between 1971 and 1981 captured a range of local styles, with two in particular by his account being the most distinct. The North Kerry style, arguably the most prominent, using both ends of the tipper to strike the baron, and the West Limerick style, where only one end of the tipper strikes a drum. Interestingly, these two regions are neighbours, and combined make up a very small geographical area in Ireland. It's also important to note that many early baron players up to and during the 1970s played with the hand, usually the first finger of the playing hand, practice which still continues to this day. And in addition to these, there were many other techniques used up to and during this period, some being accredited to geographical areas and others presumably individualistic innovation. And we can't omit the great Sean O'Riada, credited for bringing the Baron into the public psyche, whose entirely unique technique of playing was presumably developed intuitively. But when O'Riada brought it up on the stage, and then when the chieftains also included it in their lineup, it became an indoor instrument. And now it was an ensemble instrument, so it was playing with others. The aesthetic had to change. That was a new kind of challenge for Bowron players. Despite the many approaches to technique, it's the sound of the Bowron during this period which is distinct, and probably best demonstrated by Pada Mercier, Bowron player with Kulturi Kulin and the chieftains. My father was really playing in that old traditional style. He was playing motor rhythms, yeah? And for my father, it was not about the complexity of the rhythms, it was about the groove, you know? It was all about um, the pulse of the music and, and getting in and the feel of it. There's I love this about motor it. rhythm. I've heard you yeah. speak about this before and it really, it just characterizes yeah. it's this kind of groove and forward momentum. That's right, that that's just right. Has it has an electricity to it. The sound and style of Pater Mercier's Baron playing became a kind of gold standard for players in Ireland during the 1970s, including Baron legend Johnny Ringo McDonough. When I heard Pater Mercier's sound, I said, oh, that's it, like. The tone as well that he had, right? It was beautiful tone, soft tone, no high pitch ringing. And then I went down to Kerry and I was checking out people, different styles and all that. There's a lot of people playing hand playing, which I liked. Uh, now, there was a man called Carl McTighe in Ennis. He, he used to play, but he, he used to use a shotgun cartridge. He'd take out the thing and he'd put the shotgun cartridge on his finger and it was like brass and he was loud and he'd, he'd, bang, he'd bang it, you know. I preferred the softer sound that they, you know. Johnny's creative and tone-oriented approach to baron playing led him towards the next major invention in terms of the baron style. Around, around 1976-ish, I discovered one, I was looking at a drummer one night and he put a cloth on the, the snare drum to dampen it down, right? That's where I started using the hand, really palm of the hand at the back. That was the main thing with me was the sound of the drum. But I was trying all different things way back in the early days. Another hugely influential player who emerged in the 1970s was Tommy Hayes, whose individualistic and imaginative approach to playing characterises the rapidly growing baron movement of the time. When I went full time at playing music, there was only four professional baron players in the world. <laughs> there was Pader Mercier, there was Robin Martin and the Vise de Locke, there was myself, and there was Johnny Ringo and the Dunham. Yeah. And that was it. That was it. <laughs> you, know, you think about it now, there's, there's thousands of them. 
Tommy developed his own signature technique seen on this early archive clip, which he still uses to this day. I started off with using these two fingers and flicking with my wrist. Some, somebody on YouTube has described it as upside down and inside out, right? Because that's my downbeat. <laughs> okay, and that's my upbeat. So it's completely, completely different yeah. than what a lot of people do. And it, it just came up about by accident. It wasn't, it wasn't anything I kind of went for. So, yeah. Throughout the remainder of the 1970s and into the 1980s, the Baron continued to grow in popularity, and as traditional Irish music became increasingly commercialised, its reach extended beyond the global Irish diaspora, and the driving rhythm of the Baron was a good match for an increasingly confident and outward-looking tradition. There was so much creativity, new ideas coming all the time. It was a brilliant time to be alive, like. I was looking in that sense. So the Irish love the Bowron. You see, it's more than a musical instrument to the Irish as well. It's kind of like a victory symbol, mm. because if you look at the harp as a national symbol on government matters, you know. But the Bowron is more of an Irish symbol in the hearts of Irish people. The drum wasn't universally celebrated during this period of growth, with many purists who still to this day do not recognise or respect the tradition of Bowron playing, however new it may be. God, I remember writing a, an article, a letter to Irish Music Magazine because there were there was somebody writing disparaging comments on Bowron players again, and I said, well, why don't you let you get it together and teach people? You know, I mean, you know, there's lots of bad box players out there, there's lots of bad guitar players out there. Nobody gives out about them. Mm. You know, you seem to have really taken taken it on to give out about about, about percussion players. You know, so yeah, yeah, I find I've always found that difficult. Yeah. Ultimately, the popular consensus for the drum's position outshadowed these voices. M maybe it was the outsider role of the Baron that Irish people all over the world, you know, part of the diaspora, they found a connection to. Or maybe it was the increasing number of virtuoso players showcasing the musical possibilities of the drum. Or maybe just the simple universal connection that we have as a species to rhythm and indeed drumming. <laughs> The thundering rhythms of Irish music, and indeed the Baron, were no more evident in the cultural phenomenon that was Riverdance. Despite the meteoric popularity of the stage show after its first performance in 1994, the fusion of different styles, specifically in relation to the Baron, had been brewing for some time already. I was always interested in drumming, I was interested in other, other things, but I became very fascinated by Arabic drumming. North African stuff always have been, probably always will be. But at the same time, I'm a traditional player, but with all these other influences. I was hearing for the first time, you know, like the music, music from India, uh, like South Indian music, which has uh, this extraordinarily rich, old tradition. Uh, of, of percussion music. My ears were kind of being attracted to all this and what I was really drawn to, I think, were, was the percussion in those traditions. As a Bowron player sitting, playing at that time relatively simple rhythmic uh, kind of phrases and music, to hear the complexity and also to meet a tradition uh, which was so old yeah, and so evolved. Ronan O'Snodig is one of Ireland's most innovative and creative baron players whose band Keela broke new ground with their approach which blends traditional Irish music with other global influences. When did that sort of interest in the other start to kind of take well, off? Then? Let's see, I've always had an interest in the other. So I remember whenever I was kind of 18, 19, I used to buy two cassettes every week and I'd get a live cassette from Paul Laboot. He used to do live gigs. It's a long time ago, 1990 <laughs> type of time. And then I'd get a cassette from this other fella who was, uh, he was just doing African music. So I used to get, it was just, and go home and I'd listen to whatever African stuff was on his cassette and whatever Paul Laboot, you know. Um, I got more into the African stuff. I 
suppose when I was a kid in school, there was only like, I don't know, maybe that amount of Barron players, like that amount that I was aware of. Do you know, it, it wasn't a, a, a really uh, renowned thing, you know? We, I was always inventing things. Like I came up with this thing, I had a, had a slide since we were in school, you know? And I used the slide for a wavin pipe, but you see it's... It's kind of cool to get a roll on that. It just makes the roll a tiny bit louder. Yeah. I suppose I started playing a session in the harbour and I found that the sound of the barrel on gets lost here in the body, in the mid range and in the talking in a pub. And you don't hear anything. So I started using the snare and the, it projects the sound above the talking. So yeah. like a... By the mid-1990s, the enthusiasm for the Baron was growing and more and more excellent players were emerging, collectively kind of turbo-boosting the development of different playing styles and inspiring a whole generation of young players. It was the groundbreaking playing of Flukes John Joe Kelly, founded in 1995 in Manchester, that inspired Dermot Sheedy at Fermitage Green to first pick up the Baron. I feel like that was almost like a wave rushing up into lane and John Joe was just like, he was the one there that, that, that gave it to everybody in, in the package of Fluke. Okay, John Joe was bower on, but the melodies and the accompaniment was really groundbreaking with Fluke. I've seen this, the timing, the time signatures, moving away from jigs and reels, looking at the crossover, mm. seven time, 11 time, yeah. Hindustani inspired rhythms that yeah. are long note rolls, tone rolls, mm. rhythms. I go on and on, no, it's absolutely. For me, I, 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 I just, I'm obsessed with, with different types of music. Yes, I play traditional music on the Bowron, but I really want to play all different types of music. It's this fusion of influences that led Dermot to experiment with the Bowron in his band, Hermitage Green. When Hermitage Green came along, when I was like 20, now I'm playing the Bowron, this is kind of turning into a pop band. I should probably start playing drums, start playing drums, and then a couple of years into it, I was like, let's just, why don't you just play a hybrid Bowron drums? Bowron on record is great, but Bowron live mm -hmm. is experience. Like it, that, that bass rush is going to rush through your, your, your body and hit your, hit your body and vibration, everything up through you. Yeah. Now, the synthetic head is where it really flies here. Dermot was one of the first players I saw playing on a synthetic Baron head as opposed to the traditional goat and of course it sounds amazing so I was curious to find out more. It's really formed my Baron playing over the last uh, 10 years of being in the band. I went from playing jigs and reels to really now playing grooves. I know it's controversial but I believe that there is something with the synthetic head drum Baron that will further develop the instrument. I know not a lot of people are not going to enjoy that one. Why is that controversial? Maybe it's because people don't l appreciate uh, change. Um, and I can, I can acknowledge that, but uh, I'm a real futurist and I love change and I love imagining what the next evolution is going to be. And I love pushing the boundaries. I mean, maybe both can sit side by side and exist in harmony. And, you know, right. you have the more traditional drum for the more traditional scenario and the more contemporary for the more contemporary scenario. Existing in harmony, is it possible? Baron ears, Baron players, who knows? We'll just have to see. From everyone I've met in the process of making this film, it's apparent to me that innovation and individualization is central to the tradition of Baron playing. But what happens next in the Baron story? I, I think I think it's in good. I think it's in real healthy fettle. I, I really do. 
I'm kind of welcoming of everything, but it doesn't mean that you're gonna go and do it if that's not your style. It's an art, isn't it? And within art, you have expressionists and you have wacky off the wall conceptual stuff. Yeah. I certainly see it myself, like yeah. everything is yeah. welcome and yeah. people are expressing themselves and staying true to the purpose and the meaning of the music Even. and the heart of the rhythm of playing. Percussion was, is such a big part of our heritage. You're a Baron player yourself, aren't you? I am, well, I get away with it. I need to learn more. I got to a stage and I got too comfortable, so I need to push it, you know? What are the commonalities or characteristics of, of, of the, the Baron species? Stone cracked. They're all fucking mad. <laughs> this is such a beautiful sound. Yeah. This gives like such a... There's a difference. So different. There's a difference. But the same. The same. Different, but the same. Same technique. Yeah. yeah. Near, but far, far away. away. <laughs> There's a kind of a function to a barrel on player as well. Be the goat, be the ball boy, take the flack, stand up, sing a song, take the heat, and back up everyone else. For me, the barrel on, uh, it's an escape route into another, another version of us or something. The barrel on, it's like carrying my own baby close to my heart and I feel the heartbeats of that baby. And it's so beautiful. Unlike many indigenous drumming traditions in decline, the tradition of Baron is thriving. In fact, growing exponentially with masses of passionate players and makers who carry the torch forward. So what happens next in the Baron story, we'll just have to see. For me, this has been a remarkable journey into the story of our drum, the Irish Baron. And after many hours of research and reading and interviewing and editing, I still feel like I have barely touched the surface. I hope you've enjoyed watching this documentary and if you did, you can help me to make films like this by subscribing to the channel, liking the video or maybe even sharing with a friend. And finally, a massive thank you to everyone who contributed to making this series of films and all the Baron makers and players, past and present, who inspired me to make it.